Welcome to another lecture guys. We'll be talking about sepsis in the emergency department. Now we had a few discussions about sepsis, septic shock. However, um, it's important to recognize how important sepsis in the emergency department is. So we'll start with some examples. So have a look at a example with a 75 year old male who arrives with complaints of chest pain and shortness of breath. Vital signs include pulse of 110, blood pressure 95 by 65, respiratory rate of 20, and oxygen saturation 91%. The patient on examination is a pale, diaphoretic looking patient who is although talking in full sentences, and the ECD shows characteristics of an acute myocardial infarction as you can see. Now, similarly, you can also have a patient who is a 65 year old lady in the sudden onset of dysarthria hemiparesis. Vital signs include uh, pulse 75, blood pressure 155 by 75, saturation 96%. Um, on examination, areas are intract, but patient got drooling and right-sided hemiparesis. Case three is of a 76 year old female, has been generally weak for the last few days. Um, although she had a fever today and came to the emergency department, Vital signs are 88 by 50, heart rate is 105, got a temp and 95% on room air is a saturation. Now this patient looks drowsy but will talk when stimulated. The chest and abdo exam for this patient is normal. Okay, so the million dollar question is out of these three cases, who is the most likely to die in the next 30 days? So case one, case two, or case three, you know, case one was an acute MI. So the likely incidence of death in these patients is about 9%. Case two was a stroke patient. So the likely incidence of death in such patients usually reported to be about 15%. And the case three was septic shock. So this patient has a likely incidence of death of about 40%. Okay, so obviously the case three is the most likely to die in the next one month. Let's define some of the definitions regarding sepsis. Uh, first of all, we have SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Then you have sepsis. Sepsis is basically the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome and when there is a suspected infection as well somewhere. Then severe sepsis is sepsis and end organ dysfunction. And septic shock is when there is sepsis along with shock. Okay, so for systemic inflammatory response syndrome, uh, it's basically classified when the two or more of these are present. So temperature more than 38 or less than 36, heart rate more than 90, respiratory rate more than 20, white blood cells more than 12, or less than 4,000. So what does a patient in case three have? So 88 by 50 of blood pressure, heart rate 105, temperature 38.5, respiratory rate 20, and 95% on room air. So this patient has septic shock. However, if the same patient had vitals of 100 by 65, heart rate of 105, respiratory rate of 20, temp of 38.5, and it was 90% on room air, then obviously you want to find out what's a lactate. Okay, so demographics, we've got about 750,000 to about a million cases of severe sepsis in USA each year, and about 200,000 cases of septic shock each year. Uh, as you said, the mortality is in the range of 30 to 40% for sepsis, whereas for septic shock, it's a little bit higher, so about 50%. Now, why does this happen? So sepsis is basically triggered by bacterial toxins and an inflammatory cascade. Uh, it causes a progressive end organ dysfunction. Tissue hypoxia happens because of inadequate oxygen delivery. There's a mitochondrial dysfunction. Thrombi are deposited at capillary levels and there's a distributive shock. Now in severe sepsis, there's end organ dysfunction which leads to an altered mental status, decreased urinary output, acute lung injury, coagulopathy, and cardiac dysfunction. Classic 
presentation is with the lactic acidosis. Now, all of these patients, one main word that we should understand and know is an early goal directed therapy. So patients with so patients with severe sepsis or septic shock are defined when there is systolic blood pressure less than 90 after 20 to 3 milliliter per kilogram bolus over 30 minutes or the lactate is more than 4. They are randomized to a normal treatment versus early goal directed therapy. Now this is a protocol that's used in a lot of emergency departments based upon the criteria and the assessment. So whether we give a standard therapy in the emergency department or an early goal directed therapy, but monitoring is very important. So vital signs, labs, cardiac monitoring, urinary output, central venous catheterization, all these things are very, very important. Now, it's been proven that early goal directed therapy decreases mortality. In hospital mortality, it's about 30% as compared to 46% in the standard therapy. 28 day mortality is again 33% as compared to 49% in the standard therapy. And a two month mortality is 44% as compared to 56% for standard therapy. Now, the question is do you need the whole package? Isn't it enough to place just a line and do appropriate blood pressure and fluid management? Do I really need to do the whole package, especially if the vital signs have stabilized or oh, the patient in general is looking good? Well, the answer is yes, uh, placing a line is just not enough. So yes, you need the whole package. Uh, now, this is because a lot of septic patients or normoxic had lower mortality as compared to those with hypoxia and septic patients who were initially hypoxic were resuscitated through early goal directed therapy and became normoxic within six hours had similar mortality rates to those who were initially normoxic okay so cryptic shock is something to understand as well so um 86% of the standard therapy group had normalization of vital signs by six hours versus 95% in the early go directed therapy. Again, 39.8% up to 40% had persistent tissue hypoxia compared to only 5% in the early goal directed therapy group. And in-house mortality for this group with cryptic shock was 56.5% is compared to only 30% for the early directed therapy group. Sepsis bundle goals are very, very important. So initiate the central venous pressure monitoring within two hours. Uh, antibiotics are given within four hours. Early goal directed therapy is finished within six hours. And corticosteroids are given if there's a persistent hypotensive despite the vasopressors. And the lactates are monitored for clearance. Okay, so sepsis protocol includes identification of the appropriate patients and the nurses initiate the sepsis order set which includes the labs, telemetry and initiation of IV fluids. Then you activate the sepsis protocol if the patient is persistently hypotensive or if the lactate is more than four. So the appropriate patients include with an inclusion criteria of SERS with a suspected infection or an exclusion criteria, whether it's an acute cerebrovascular accident, coronary syndrome, pulmonary edema, or there's a history of congestive heart failure. Um, so when you talk about the nurse initiated order set, it includes labs, which is lactate, complete blood count, blood cultures, um, urine analysis. So uh, if the patient is unable to avoid, you uh, catch urine from, through the catheter. Other ones include a chest x-ray and an ECG, which are obviously a basic workup of any serious patient presenting in the emergency department, then telemetry. And if the systolic is less than 90 or the lactate is more than four, you should notify your consultant immediately, initiate IV fluids and reassess the patient. So sepsis protocol is initiated if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 and more than after 20, um, 20 mils per kilogram bolus or lactate is more than four. So you notify the ED physician, move the patient to room um, if available. 
and you immediately page out sepsis protocol in ED to your attendee resident and the emergency department pharmacist. Central line placement should ideally be done within less than two hours. And the nursing and the emergency man, ma, management team will do sterile prep for the uh, central line. Uh, we discuss the plant site, position the patient, prep and drape the patient, open and prep the central line kit, and notify that the central line is ready for placement to your doctor. So the MD doctor will place line with the nursing and the emergency management team assistance, and CVP monitoring is recorded with vital signs. Labs include venous blood gases, PT, PTT, type and screen, and start chest x-ray after line placement. Early antibiotics are also necessary, less than four hours. Broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, we should ensure that blood cultures are drawn, especially two, and ED pharmacists should facilitate these things. So the early goal-directed therapy, um, now, all of this management depends upon how things look like after 500 mils of bolus. If the CVP is more than 8 to 12, you measure the mean arterial pressure. And then based upon that, uh, the patient may or may not need transfusion, uh, depending upon how things look like after the initial resuscitation. So in summary, sepsis and septic shock are common presentations in the emergency department. Uh, vital signs are important in defining the sepsis and early recognition and prompt treatment of sepsis can decrease mortality very significantly. Thanks for watching. Keep coming back for more. Do not forget to subscribe and share the video.